everyone. Thanks for coming to our presentation today, our cat chat series, which happens every Tuesday, four o'clock here, Laser Hall 13. So today we're gonna be covering life happens, ways to empower students with disabilities. So I was kind of wondering you know, how you guys learn about this program. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. Nice, cool. Well, I just was working with me. Gotcha. You want to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Andrea Blair. I'm the director of the Student Access Center, and we provide accommodations and services to students with a wide range of disabilities, and I'm happy to be here today. Should I keep going? And my name is Kyung Baek. I am a doctor of psychology intern working at the Counseling Services. Um, again, you know, with Andrea and other wonderful folks on campus, we serve a variety of students who are in need of a lot of assistance that we can offer to you. So hopefully, you know, today's presentation can be helpful. So your background's counseling, yes. psychology, my background's education. Okay. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, I'm hoping that everyone might have a phone or a smartphone preferably or it doesn't matter what kind of phone but if you have it I'd like for you to get it out and we're going to do a really quick little poll and if you don't have one maybe um, you can just think in your head um, what what the question is going to be so we'll wait um, all right and I don't know if y'all have seen this before or maybe you've heard about it um, polleverywhere.com. Um, the shoe tight. This purple bar across the top is something we're going to talk about later, but I can't figure out how to hide it, so just <laughs> pretend it's not there. So what I want you to do, if I can find my mouse, the first word that comes to mind when you hear the word disability is, and what you're going to do is Go to your texting. And it's working. But what you're going to do is you're going to, um, instead of texting Andrea Blair, you're going to text the number 37607. I'm mad at you. Work. <laughs> it's it's frozen up, which might be not worth it anyway. We're already falling apart. We're having some technical issue here. <laughs> Wait, it will be back soon. Yes. So, 37607, and then in the space where you write, where you type in your text to someone, you're going to put Andrea Blair, like up here, A-N-D-R-E-A-B-L-A-I-R, -E and it doesn't really matter if it's capitalized or not. if it works. And then you should get a text back that says you've joined. Once that's happened, then I want you to text 37607 again, and I want you to put in that word. The first word that comes to mind when you hear the word disability is, and type in a word.
and it should show up up here if it's working. Has everyone done that? So it didn't work. Okay, well it worked just fine for me earlier. And yeah. hmm. Okay, well then for some reason it's not active. So instead of wasting everybody's time, and I apologize. So Why don't we just go around and maybe we can just hear yeah. what came to mind. I will tell you, mine was brave. Assistance. Assistance. Problem. Problem. Okay. A characteristic. Common. In NATO. Because, you know, one of the things that we're going to be discussing is actually perception of disability, how it is perceived by us. How do we see it and how do we process it? How do we interact with it? What's the relationship that we have with disability in our community? Any thoughts? Or your own perceptions? Where is this, you know, a possible idea of, you know, what, what are some of the you know, biases, let's say, that are common among disability or the topic of disability? <coughs> Limiting, yes? So some people may take it as a means to more of an income, is that what you're saying? Or well, I was thinking more like in school, like people think like, oh like I need extra time or gotcha. Gotcha. That is paired up with some sense of fairness. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. somebody else got something that they mm -hmm. Thank you for your Opinion. Any other thoughts? I asked a student today about um, the parking, disabled parking mm -hmm. placard on, on cars and how I think it's misused. And I think that sometimes it could be the student who actually has a legitimate one mm -hmm. that loans it to their roommate so they can get a parking place or a closer parking place. I think it's grandma who has two of them and only needs one and so you pick one up. I was in the parking garage today mm -hmm. and I noticed someone parked in a handicapped spot or in a disabled spot. I'm trying not to use the word handicap. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and they weren't their tag wasn't hanging. Instead it was stuffed kind of in the front of the uh, uh, mm -hmm. car, you know, dashboard. The dashboard yeah. And you couldn't see the number, you couldn't see the date. And um, I, I could almost promise you that it mm -hmm. was probably some old date and some old. But I asked the student today, I said, what do you think about students misusing that? And, um, and do you think it because they have grandmas or their roommates share it with them? And he said that he thinks that a lot of people, um, wh where he went with it is he thought a lot of people use it who shouldn't be using it. So he sees mm. people parking, getting out of the car, and running to class. And that's what he picked up on when mm. I just asked the student randomly. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I know that I have students with cystic fibrosis. I have students with this, which is a respiratory issue. I have students with um, arthritis. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, or other medical conditions, yes. um, heart conditions or whatever. 
that you wouldn't necessarily know. But um, I think that that is really something that's misused around, and I'm sure your students, right? Are you a student? Are you a student? So anyway. So yeah, it seems like you know we have a lot of mixed and somewhat confused. And it's negative. Confused. Yes. It's negative. And I actually wanted to talk about just a little bit of the sur summary of, um, it's, a, it's a research study that was done in England and about perception of disabilities among people. And I wanted to just share just a couple things. A person who uses a wheelchair and a blind person are most frequently defined as being disabled, whereas a person with HIV, AIDS, and a person with a severe facial dis Disfigure, uh, disfigurement are most frequently not seen as dis disabled. And also, um, disabled, respond disabled respondents with mental health conditions were more likely to consider schizophrenia and depression to be disabilities, while respondents with non-disabling um, dis conditions didn't see that way. So I wanted to kind of talk about, you know, when it comes to disability, we often focus a lot on um, also physical aspect of it. What about, you know, I really like the, use, uh, the word that you used, invisible disability. What about that? Do you see, you know, someone who has severe depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, those conditions, do you believe that they are in a condition of disabled condition? Or at least, you know, when we say legal concept. A lot of people have depression, but when <clears throat> it might become legally disabling is going to be when it's severe enough that it really impacts your daily life in some mm -hmm. way. However, you know, unfortunately, a lot of cases, you know, go, I guess, with stigma or stigmatizing perceptions around it. Hey, just snap out of it. Why can't you just go to class and just, just get out of bed? Yeah, just get out of bed and just take the exam. Why can't you do it? So a lot of students who do come to, let's say, you know, to our counseling services or anybody just who I encounter in that kind of situations, they talk a lot about how frustrated they feel when people do not see it as debilitating and brave, you know, struggle they're going through every day. So I kind of wanted to you know, give you the opportunity to think about how we treat disability that is not always visible. How do we make terms with it? Do we have any stigma, bias, stereotypes? They may not be very true. Real thing, or how does it affect students who are actually going through the struggles when they hear such feedback from, you know, teachers, friends, roommates, parents, media, media, absolutely. They tend to minimize their struggles. They also may take it internally, thinking that, oh, there's something wrong with me inherently, rather than this is a condition that's making it really difficult for me to do certain things. 
taking, that's taking power away from individuals, making smaller and smaller room for the world for them to stand in. Do you want to weigh in a little bit? Um, these were a, a characteristic and in need of and a problem and assist, needs assistance. And I forget what you said, Andrea. Say again? Common. Common. And then you said brave. Of course, I work with the brave souls all day long. <laughs> um, I will tell you that when students come in, particularly with ADD or depression or anxiety, other mental health concerns, they, or, or hidden disabilities, they are, they do not want to be there, they're nervous, um, they don't want to ask for help, but they must not be doing well in school or they wouldn't have come to the office. Exactly. Um, and um, I, I did, I, I do think that faculty could, could use some more education around all of that. I agree with you. Because, you know, and I, and I see they come in, you know, a student comes in and they're very upset because no one understands and they feel mm -hmm. very alone. Um, they feel lost and they feel frustrated. They feel also uh, unmotivated and undermined. Their abilities are greatly undermined because what's really shown on their exam or homework is not necessarily truly in the reflecting their, tr I guess, true intelligence or intellectual abilities to perform certain things. But think about it, when you have a broken leg and somebody asks you to run, you can run, but with a broken leg, it can be a little difficult. So you gotta understand that this may not be truly the potential this person may have, given the circumstance that person is experiencing. However, when it comes to individual disabilities, it's not usually recognized that way. It's like, no, oh, you were just lying. There's no x-ray for it. Yes. So, um, for that, actually, we have a um, very ins inspiring video that we wanted to share with you all in terms of how, you know, invisible disabilities such as depression could influence a person's life, person's perception, and his or her relationship with the world and people and how it hurts, actually. I think you'll like it. And we have it on here somewhere? Um, yeah, it was on actually on the internet browser. Is it gone? <laughs> it might have been gone. <laughs> well. Oh, actually we could have, I think, restored the page. Are the best. <laughs> there it is. This could be a story of you, your brother, sister, mother, father, neighbors, anybody. Hot tech here, hot tech. <laughs> I felt like I was living two different lives. There's the life that everyone sees. And then there's the life that only I see. And in the life that everyone sees, who I am is a friend, a son, a brother, a stand-up comedian, and a teenager. That's the life everyone sees. If you were asked my friends and family to describe me, that's what they would tell you. And that's a huge part of me. That is who I am. And if you're asking me to describe myself, I'd probably say some of those same things. And I wouldn't be lying, but I wouldn't totally be telling you the truth either. Because the truth is, that's just the life everyone else sees. In the life that only I see, who I am, who I really am, is someone who struggles intensely with depression. I have for the last six years of my life, and I continue to every day. Now for someone who 
has never experienced depression or doesn't really know what that means, that might surprise them to hear because there's a pretty popular misconception that depression is just being sad when something in your life goes wrong. When you break up with your girlfriend, when you lose a loved one, when you don't get the job you wanted. But that's sadness, that's a natural thing, that's a natural human emotion. Real depression isn't being sad when something in your life goes wrong. Real depression is being sad when everything in your life is going right. That's real depression and that's what I suffer from. And to be totally honest, that's hard for me to stand up here and say. It's hard for me to talk about. And it seems to be hard for everyone to talk about it, so much so that no one's talking about it. And no one's talking about depression, but we need to be, because right now it's a massive problem. It's a massive problem. But we don't see it on social media, right? We don't see it on Facebook, we don't see it on Twitter, we don't see it on the news, because it's not happy, it's not fun, it's not light. And so because we don't see it, we don't see the severity of it. But the severity of it, the seriousness of it is this. Every 30 seconds, every 30 seconds, somewhere, someone in the world takes their own life because of depression. And it might be two blocks away, it might be two countries away, it might be two continents away, but it's happening, it's happening every single day. And we have a tendency as a society to look at that and go, so what? So what? We look at that and we go, that's your problem, that's their problem. We say we're sad and we say we're sorry, but we also say, so what? Well, two years ago, two years ago was my problem. Because I sat on the edge of my bed, where I'd sat a million times before, and I was suicidal. I was suicidal. And if you were to look at my life on the surface, you, you wouldn't see a kid who was suicidal. You'd see a kid who was the captain of his basketball team, the drum and theater student of the year, the English student of the year, someone who was consistently on the honor roll and consistently at every party. So you would say I wasn't depressed, you would say I wasn't suicidal, but you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong. So I sat there that night beside a bottle of pills with a pen and paper in my hand, and I thought about taking my own life, and I came this close to doing it. I came this close to doing it. And I didn't. So that makes me one of the lucky ones, one of the people who gets to step out on the ledge and look down but not jump. One of the lucky ones who survives. Well, I survived, and that just leaves with my story. And my story is this. In four simple words, I suffer from depression. I suffer from depression. And for a long time, I think I was living two totally different lives, where one person was always afraid of the other. I was afraid that people would see me for who I really was, that I wasn't the perfect popular kid in high school everyone thought I was, that beneath my smile there was struggle, and beneath my light there was dark, and beneath my big personality just hid even bigger pain. See, some people might fear girls not liking them back, some people might fear sharks, some people might fear death, but for me, for a large part of my life, I feared myself. I feared my truth, I feared my honesty, I feared my vulnerability, and that fear made me feel like I was forced into a corner. I was forced into a corner and there was only one way out. And so I thought about that way every single day. I thought about it every single day, and if I'm being totally honest standing here, I've thought about it again since, because that's the sickness. That's the struggle, that's depression, and depression isn't chicken pox. You don't beat it once and it's gone forever. It's something you live with. It's something you live in. It's the roommate you can't kick out, it's the voice you can't ignore, it's the feelings you can't seem to escape. And the scariest part is, the scariest part is, is that after a while, you become numb to it. It becomes normal for you. And what you really fear the most isn't the suffering inside of you, it's the stigma inside of others, it's the, it's the shame, it's the embarrassment, it's the disapproving look on a friend's face, it's the, it's the whispers in the hallway that you're weak, it's the comments that you're crazy, that's what that's what keeps you from getting help. That's what makes you hold it in and hide it. It's the stigma, so you hold it in and you hide it. And you hold it in and you hide it. And even though it's keeping you in bed every day and it's making your life feel empty no matter how much you try and fill it, you hide it because the stigma in our society around depression is very real. It's very real. And if you think that it isn't, ask yourself this. Would you rather make your next Facebook status say you're having a tough time getting out of bed because you hurt your back? Or you're having a tough time getting out of bed every morning because you're depressed. That's the stigma. Because unfortunately, we live in a world where if you break your arm 
everyone runs over to sign your cast. But if you tell people you're depressed, everyone runs the other way. That's the stigma. We are so, so, so accepting of any body part breaking down other than our brains. And that's ignorance. That's pure ignorance. And that ignorance has created a world that doesn't understand depression, that doesn't understand mental health. And that's ironic to me because depression is one of the best documented problems we have in the world. It was one of the least discussed. We just push it aside and put it in a corner and pretend it's not there and hope it'll fix itself. Well, it won't. It hasn't and it's not going to because that's wishful thinking. And wishful thinking isn't a game plan, it's procrastination. And we can't procrastinate on something this important. The first step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one, but we haven't done that. So we can't really expect to find an answer when we're still afraid of the question. And I, I don't know what the solution is. I wish I did, but I don't. But I think, I think it has to start here. It has to start with me. It has to start with you. It has to start with the people who are suffering, the ones who are hidden in the shadows. We need to speak up and shatter the silence. We need to be the ones who are brave for what we believe in, because if there's one thing that I've come to realize that there's one thing that I see as the biggest problem. It's not in building a world where we eliminate the ignorance of others. It's in building a world where we teach the acceptance of ourselves. We're okay with who we are because when we get honest, we see that we all struggle and we all suffer, whether it's with this, whether it's with something else. We all know what it is to hurt. We all know what it is to have pain in our heart. And we all know how important it is to heal. But right now, depression is society's deep cut that we're content to put a band-aid over and pretend it's not there. Well, it is there. It is there. And you know what? It's okay. Depression is okay. If you're going through it, know that you're okay. And know that you're sick. You're not weak. And it's an issue, not an identity. Because when you get past the fear and the ridicule and the judgment and the stigma of others, you can see depression for what it really is. And that's just a part of life just a part of life and as much as I hate, as much as I hate some of the places, some of the parts of my life depression has dragged me down to, in a lot of ways I'm grateful for it. Because yeah, it's put me in the valleys, but only to show me there's peaks, and yeah, it's dragged me through the dark, but only to remind me there's light. My pain, more than anything in 19 years on this planet has given me perspective and my hurt, my hurts forced me to have hope, have hope and to have faith, faith in myself faith in others, faith that it can get better, that we can change this, that we can speak up and speak out and fight back against ignorance, fight back against intolerance. And more than anything, learn to love ourselves. Learn to accept ourselves for who we are, the people we are, not the people the world wants us to be. Because the world I believe in is one where embracing your light doesn't mean ignoring your dark. The world I believe in is one where we're measured by our ability to overcome adversities, not avoid them. The world I believe in is one where I can look someone in the eye and say, I'm going through hell. And they can look back at me and go, me too, and that's okay. And it's okay because depression is okay. We're people. We're people and we struggle and we suffer and we bleed and we cry. And if you think that true strength means never showing any weakness, then I'm here to tell you you're wrong. You're wrong because it's the opposite. We're people and we have problems. We're not perfect and that's okay. So we need to stop the ignorance, stop the intolerance, stop the stigma and stop the silence. We need to take away the taboos, take a look at the truth and start talking. Because the only way we're gonna beat a problem that people are battling alone is by standing strong together. By standing strong together. And I believe that we can. I believe that we can. Thank you guys so much. This is a great thank you. Thank you. comedians yeah. it seems like with a lot of mental health and of course issues and when I saw this I thought about Robin Williams who I grew up with mm -hmm. and, and most of us know who Robin Williams is but there are if you google it you will find that for some for whatever reason um, mm -hmm. a lot of comedians certainly maybe they're the ones in the media of course mm -hmm. um, what do you think about this
Thoughts? Yeah, exactly. We don't have to be in the darkness. We don't have to be hidden behind the shadow. All we have to do is embrace the fact that it is okay. Whether it's physical or non-physical disabilities, it's okay. It's simple to say it, but different thing to practice it. So, well, I was wondering if we could kind of change the shift a little bit. I mean, shift the gear a little bit and focus on some of the, you know, cool, actually, um, technology that we have to assist anybody, anyone on campus in terms of, you know, their successful life, successful academic experiences. You ready to experience that coolness? Yeah. 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 Let me. Um, I have this oh, one yes. slide that I want to share with everyone, and it's that anyone can become disabled at any time. So, you know, I think sometimes when we have faculty that aren't very supportive <coughs> and understanding, it's probably because they haven't, ex or they they haven't maybe acknowledged it or experienced it in their own life. Um, but any one of us can come become disabled at any time. As we walk out and cross the road, um, Anne had reminded me about a story this morning, um, a student that, that we have who um, was coming home from spring break or something from Wichita on Highway 77, and she makes a point to say that she wasn't texting, but she had reached over to change a CD or pick up a CD off the floor or, or something. It took her attention away for a minute. And she kind of went off the road a little bit. And as we all do when we go off the road a little bit, we tend to overcorrect. Correct. And of course, she overcorrected and had a, <clears throat> an automobile accident and is, is now a wheelchair user. And after a year of rehab, et cetera, she is certainly back at K-State. Um, but we have multiple stories like that. And you know, so when we talk about um, disabilities, I mean, even I, I believe um, some mental health mm -hmm. conditions sometimes don't even kind of come to the surface mm -hmm. until you're 18, 19, 20 mm -hmm. years old. Um, and even if you know you experience, you know, start experiencing symptoms, you may not have the awareness what it is that of that what's going on. Yes. So a lot of you know students, a lot of individuals just their conditions go undetected for a long time, and they're suffering. We've come a long way, and of course we have the Americans with Disabilities Act. America's beautiful in that way. Not all countries have the the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act in, in, in ensuring that you know everyone has equal opportunity um, to participate. You know, way back when we had insane asylums. If we had individuals who seemed to not fit in, we would kind of just put them away and institutionalize them and lock the door, and they couldn't leave, and they were quite mistreated. Um, and and then we kind of had uh, psych the, the birth of psychiatry, and we had lobotomies. That's when they would cut away the frontal <laughs> lobe of your brain, thinking that would help. We were kind of in this mentality that, that you're, you you got a problem, we're going to fix you, okay? Um, and this picture here I, I, I like because this is really what, what's, what really started the, um, the idea that, you know, civil rights was in the 1960s, of course, um, where we started as a society realizing that's not how we treat each other, so that's not what we do with people. Um, that, that maybe the issue isn't with the person, the issue is with the environment. And this is a, a, a wonderful example of people in wheelchairs, individuals in wheelchairs who obviously can't ride the bus there. Um, but we've come a long, long ways. Mm -hmm. um, universal design is kind of a buzzword out there, but it basically is designing almost anything you can think of in a way that everyone can benefit from it. And down here on the bottom, my bottom, this bottom left, you know, when you go to the city and you um, experience public transportation, many of the buses have ramps. Okay, everyone can ride the bus. Um, down here on the bottom right, 
Closed captioning. Um, I think you gave me the statistic, 80% of the people who use closed captioning do not have a hearing impairment. Um, who uses closed captioning in here and why? I like to know, like, if I watch again, I like to keep it. I just like to know what they say. The Lord of the Rings, movies like that, sometimes I'll put the closed captions on because I can't really understand necessarily what mm -hmm. they're saying, but very good. Did you raise your hand? No. Do you ever use closed captioning? No, I don't. Do you ever go to a restaurant and watch the news with the closed captioning? Uh, sometimes, if you can't hear it. Yeah, because a lot of times they have it turned down, right, if it's yeah. a bar or, or a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Some of you had your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Individuals where English is not their first language, I think it can be helpful as well. That's why I use CC. English, right. Mm -hmm. Very good. The, the ramps up top here, that really is what started the whole universal design. We had soldiers coming back who had lost their legs in the war. They couldn't get any place. They couldn't get in their buildings. They couldn't get to jobs. Um, so, we, you know, we have, we have curb cuts. All kind of people use curb cuts, not just people who, who, for example, are in a wheelchair. Who else uses a curb cut? Bicyclists? Who else? I use the curb cut. I'm not quite sure. The curb cut? Not a clear picture, but, um, but uh, basically when you're oh, in an intersection, when you have a little ramp instead of a curb there, that's called a curb cut because they cut the curb. Right, and a lot of them will have little red bumps on it sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, That's and for people that use a cane so that they know that they're going out into a street. Mm -hmm. People who are blind or have visual impairments. And, yep. and then the last one up here is, of course, the smartphone. Um, you know, it's a, it's a way to communicate to people. How many of y'all use Siri? Um, you know, I mean, there's convenient. Just, it's very convenient. If you have fine motor skills, just to be able to say, call Ann, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of where we're at, and that's where we're heading um, more and more. And on campus here, we're really trying to do a good job um, at some of this. This purple bar up here, my famous person right over here, I told him I couldn't figure out how to get the bar off. Um, <laughs> this is Ann Pierce. Ann also works in the Access Center with me. We serve students with disabilities. Um, we show them different kinds of software. We provide test-taking accommodations. We brown books. We enlarge books. Students can come take exams in, um, in, a, in a smaller space, particularly if they have a lot of anxiety or if they have attention difficulties. Um, so those are the kind of things that we do, and you, you two know that, and you might, but I definitely want you two students to know. Um, and we serve a wide range of disabilities. Over 80% of the students that we serve, you would not know they had a disability by looking at them. Okay? So the professor says, I don't have anyone in my class who, with a disability. Well, you know what? They probably do, but they mm -hmm. just don't. But Anne's going to just take uh, five or ten minutes to show you the software called Read and Write. Right now it is on the computers in the library, but soon every student and faculty and staff will be able to access it with your EID. Um, let me help you here. And I think we still have your stuff open down there right. somewhere. Right, right here you want here. This is very cool stuff, another good example. This not only helps people with disabilities, but it's going to help anybody. Mm -hmm. So that's how you get rid of the toolbar, <laughs> <laughs> the anchor. Um, but one of the nice things, so, so when you're using it, you can have it up on the top, you can have it to the side, you can have it to the bottom. And, and dock it, but if you're not using it, then you can go ahead and just kind of get it out of your way and then it kind of disappears. So uh, the nice thing about Read and Write Gold is it is uh, a toolbar so that you students, faculty, whoever uh, will be using the product will be using their own applications, Word, Pages, 
what, whatever you uh, are familiar with, you're not going to be going into an application and having to stay in that application. It's just a support. And uh, if you don't remember anything that I say at all, remember one thing, and that is uh, in the menu bar, they have uh, an all video uh, tours. And so each feature, there's about 30 features to this toolbar. Uh, any feature you can go to and you can uh, look at a very short how-to video. And so if I clicked on voice note, then it will come up. A voice note. You can add a voice note to Microsoft Word that will allow you to record a spoken message. To do this, click where you wish to add the note and then on the voice note icon. With your microphone in place, click on start. Okay, this particular how-to video is 57 seconds long. Most of them are anywhere between one and three minutes. So very quick, just showing you where to go, what to do, and, and you're ready to go and use uh, that feature of uh, the product. Another thing that I really like about the toolbar is that you can customize it. So you can go up to the menu, you can uh, look at the different toolbars, but I keep it on my features because these are the things that I use and then the other icons are not there to distract me. So the, one of the main features of the software is the text-to-speech engine. So you simply go up here and click play. Instructions for scanning a book. First step, cut the binding off book. Get a cut and bind requisition form from the business office. Take the book to the Union Copy and Print Center to have them cut the binding. Okay, so again, this is customizable. You can change the voice, you can change the colors, change you, the can, you can change the speed. Uh, and, and so all of those things are, are in your power to, to do whatever you would like to. Uh, another feature of this product is, oh, yes. Um, we'll get there. That's, that's okay, great. But um, uh, another feature of this is, let's say I'm ready to go to the RAC Center. I'm going to be there for an hour and a half. And so what I want to do is I want to have an MP3 of some, of some information so that I can go ahead and um, do multitask, which I'm... Ride the bicycle and not, listen to your textbook, students. Right. So... Uh, so you, so I'm not going to do this because it's like the cooking show. I've already, I've already done the steps. But you select the information about uh, uh, of the information that you want to change into an MP3, and then you come up here and you click on Speech Maker, and then you have choices. Again, you have choices. What do you want to do? Uh, and it will do. It will convert to an MP3, and then you can listen. Full step. Binding book, double check that the file is open and highlightable. Go to the Union Copy and Print Center and request the book be rebound. And so what I think is that if you're going to listen for an hour and a half to a voice, it needs to be a fun voice. And so uh, you can decide on the uh, accent that you want to listen to. And so that's another feature that I think a lot of students will get a, a, some good use out of. And then uh, your question about the PDF, there are a couple of things uh, that, that you can do for PDF. It does have a optical character recognition engine inside the software, which means it can take a PDF and it can uh, look at the characters and it can uh, then uh, make it so that it's searchable, so that it's readable, and so assistive technology can interact with it. However, there are a lot of um, professors who post uh, PDFs on K-State Online, uh, some of which are um, not the best, <laughs> underlines, handwritings, and all that. Um, if a student uh, is confronted with uh, an article that they can't read, um, there is 
a screenshot reader, which I'm going to demonstrate. And this would be something that if, if it were like they, they needed the information, they, they want to read it, but they don't want to go to all the trouble of scanning it in and doing the OCR and all that, then you can come up here and you can click on uh, screenshot reader. And then you can capture what you want. And then it will automatically uh, do an OCR on the fly. Of State Hillary Clinton is followed by European diplomats and government officials as she departs from a press conference in Sarajevo, Bosnia. Clinton, who logged more miles of travel than any of her predecessors, was widely praised in a... Okay, I will say that when you do have underlines and you have handwriting, I mean, depending on, on the original, it could be that this would be a lot worse. Uh, it, it's, so OCR is not perfect. It really, I mean, garbage in, garbage out uh, definitely applies in this particular case. And so the, the PDF, there's just two things that it can do. I mean, it can scan in and then you have, uh, it will scan into Word. So then you can edit that and, and it's accessible to assistive technology or you can do something like this on the fly when it's something that you have to have, a student has to have um, and doesn't have a whole lot of time. So another uh, feature that I will show you and, and this will be kind of, oh yeah, this will be kind of the, the end having said that 30 tools are in here so uh, I'm just kind of hitting the highlights here but if you are if you are doing some research and I think this will be a handy tool for uh, a lot of students you're doing a paper you're writing a paper and you're just collecting your facts then one of the things that you can do is use the highlighters. So we have yellow, we have blue, we have green, and we have pink. And so let's say you've gone through, you've got You've got all your blues, you've, you've done this whole article and you're ready to, to do something with this information. Then you can go and you can collect your highlights. And then you have choices. Do you want the, just the blue highlights? Do you want all your highlights? How do you want this arranged? How much space do you want in between? And then you can also say that you want a bibliography. The choices are APA, MLA, and Harvard. Now, I just had a meeting with three uh, librarians, and I was told when I demonstrated this that we need to be sure that we tell people who are using this that unless the information that you're collecting from here is, is, has the metadata, the correct metadata, then this doesn't work. Um, correctly so it's going to give you the information useful information I would think because it's going to show you where you got this information but you, you shouldn't use this the format uh, the bibliography uh, as a yes this is 100% correct you will still have to go in and maybe do some editing there so let's just stick with Harvard and it takes it into Word. It has it by the color, and then you can take that information and do what you need to do with that. Scroll down a little bit. And, and then it gathers the information. And then the bibliography is at least going to tell you where you got that information so that when you've got 10 or 12 or 20 different places that you've collected information, uh, it's very helpful to know, oh yeah, I got that from this website or I got this from that website and I need to double check and do this. So, so do people have questions?
Yes. Um, OME, uh, the Office of Mediated, Mediated Edu Edu Education, uh, they are, uh, they have a service ticket now and they're supposed to be working on it. And what will happen is uh, there is a KSU download page where, it, where people can download and it will be available to anybody who has an EID and a password. Right. And Mac and PC, so you you know if you have a Mac and a PC, then you can. I think the versions are a little bit different, um, but uh, they will be available. And there'll be a, some marketing and some training and some opportunities. So, oh yeah, so oh yeah, it's been yeah, press, right. So. It's been purchased, and we're all on the on the go. So, do do you see it as being useful to a wide variety of of people? Yeah. Yes, all the all the computers that are in the commons. The, mm -hmm, yeah, they are all. Yes, they are all um, loaded on there. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and then this uh, is at the libraries, lib.ksu.edu slash apps app that I wanted to show you. Let's see if this will work. Okay. Well, this is kind of neat. So this is called an assignment planner, and you can go in there and actually put in what your, have you seen, have y'all looked at this at all? You put in your assignment. Um, your email, your phone is optional, but it will actually send you an email and or a text to remind you of that something is due. So you have to input it, um, and, I, and for example, if you're working on a paper, and there are, there are various steps to a paper, first you've got to think of your topic, and then you have to go do some research, and then you have to kind of write an outline, and then you have this, this, this. It will actually generate a calendar for you if it knows kind of when your due date is, and you will get a text message or an email that says, hi, I'm your assignment planner. You are supposed to go do research at the library today. Um, <laughs> or your paper's due today, but you don't hope that you get that before you get all the other <laughs> of course. Um, so I wanted to show you that. That's a good reminder in study planning. And it's, you know, it's free and it's easy. It's very mm -hmm. easy. And then this LiveSafe uh, is an app that um, you can download to your phone that, um, that you will be hearing more about on campus. But it allows you, it's really a safety app. And it allows you to um, report suspicious behavior. It has a map, a GPS, that would allow you to, um, in, like if you're walking home from somewhere and you're by yourself, you can actually invite someone to join you and they can see you where you are and that you're walking and that you get home safely. I was thinking about students with disabilities and I was thinking about some students who might get lost due to a visual impairment or just directionality issues. Um, or a student with seizures? a student with a, who feels like they're going to have a seizure because you can just hit a button and it will immediately go to the police or, or there's, you know, there's some different options in there, but they can tell where you are by the G, using the GPS. Another thing I thought about was someone who may be feeling like they're having a panic attack or, or a suicidal. Yeah. Do you all have any other ideas about how that might get used, the safety app for someone with a disability? No, no. That, that's a different one that didn't go very far, mm -hmm. and this one offers some other options like that, and I think you might even be able to do that with this one, but it has some additional <laughs> options. I know, too. I would be scared of it too. But you can, you know, it's free, K-State, uh, you, can, you can download it to your phones, and, um, which I recommend that you do, and if we had time, I'd make you do it right now. <laughs> but thank you for coming. Yes, thank you all for coming, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact us anytime. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.